Really good question asked by a student here. How do we interpret the PaO2 value? Since I mentioned, here's the value looking for for pH, here's the value looking for for CO2. What about PaO2? Well, that's a little bit more complicated. So the oxygen level is obviously vary quite a lot in patients, which you know from your own experience, having seen you know questions or patients where oxygen saturations. 92% in this patient, 96% in this patient. Well, saturation correlates with the PaO2 value, even if they're not exactly the same. And so what that means is that there's a variety of numbers that we might be okay with when it comes to PaO2. But the general rule of thumb that I would kind of stick to is that if somebody has a PaO2 value that's falling lower than 70 on the exam, so 70 millimeters of mercury, the normal value being 100 in a healthy normal individual, if it falls below 70, we start to kick in what's called our hypoxic drive. So what I want to emphasize here is that all of us have a respiratory driver that's telling our med medulla how fast we should be breathing. And before I mentioned it, you guys were all probably breathing autonomously. Now you're probably all thinking about breathing at this point, so I'm sorry about that. But before that, you were breathing at a certain rate based on the CO2 level in your blood. Everybody at baseline is operating on what's called a hypercapnic drive. We keep CO2 exactly at 40. If it goes a little bit above 40, we start to hypoventilate a little bit to bring us down. If we breathe a little too fast and the CO2 goes down, our brainstem tells us to stop breathing so much so we can pop right back up to 40. 40 is the number that we're seeking for PaCO2. And so as a result, we're gonna be like laser focused on that. But what if our oxygen levels drop despite the fact that our CO2 is okay? If that happens, now we're gonna start breathing faster for oxygen. We're not very good at that. The hypoxic drive doesn't really improve our oxygen very well. Imagine yourself going up to the top of a tall mountain where the environmental oxygen is like 60 millimeters of mercury You'll breathe very fast because you're hypoxic, but you won't really fix your oxygen level as a result. So our hypoxic drive is another way that we'll breathe fast. But the reason I'm bringing up our respiratory drivers is because CO2 and O2 are the two things we're paying attention to when we intubate a patient. And when they give you a question of mechanical ventilation and they say, what do you want to do? How do you fix this patient who is being intubated, mechanically ventilated? In the vast majority of cases, they're going to be asking you, should I be fixing the oxygen? Yes or no. Should I be fixing the carbon dioxide? Yes or no. And how would I fix the carbon dioxide or the oxygen mm -hmm. in this patient? And so if the CO2 value is not 40, you probably want to fix it. If the oxygen value is below 70, that's probably where you need to start making an intervention for that mm -hmm. patient. For reference, somewhere around 60 from, uh, millimeters of mercury is roughly around like an 88% oxygen saturation. And that's the number clinically that we really hate to go below is around like 88, 89% in that territory. So when the oxygen falls below 70 into the 60s or below that, that's where we're gonna to wanna to intervene. And that comes to how do we intervene? Now for oxygen, the first answer is super easy, just give them more oxygen. So the fraction of inspired oxygen, super straightforward answer, just give them some more of that, that should improve their oxygenation in the vast majority of cases. The other way that we can fix oxygen is called PEEP or positive end expiratory pressure. I'm gonna set that one aside for a second. We'll come back to defining what that means in a moment. And for carbon dioxide, the real thing that matters for CO2 is simply the respiratory rate and the tidal volume. Together, these two values roughly uh, equate to what's called the minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is like the cardiac output, but for your lungs. So heart rate times stroke volume is how much blood your heart's pumping out. Respiratory rate times tidal volume is how much air your lungs are moving around, essentially. And because CO2 is not a diffusion-limited gas in the way that oxygen is, I really don't care what's happening to the lungs. As long as I'm moving air, I'm probably breathing out CO2 in many cases. And so there's a direct correlation, an inverse relationship. The more you're breathing, the less CO2 will have. And so that means if you want your patient to have less CO2, you increase their respiratory rate or you increase their tidal volume. If you want them to have more CO2, you decrease the respiratory rate or you decrease their tidal volume. So CO2 is a little bit more tricky than oxygen insofar as it can be high or low and you wanna fix it. Oxygen generally just goes low and then you bring it back up. But these are the only four variables that you're ever really gonna choose in answers about mechanical ventilation. And you're gonna see repetitive questions in UWorld, on MBME practice tests, and on the real exam that just keep asking the same thing over and over again. So when we start equipping ourselves with the knowledge that we can only really answer these four things for a mechanical ventilation question, they become a lot easier to understand. Um, anything to add to that, Sana? No, that's perfect. And I really love the way you outline sort of the differences. And this, this should be like an algorithm for all of you. You should look at, you know, when you see a mechanically ventilated patient, 
and they're asking, what do we do now? It's always going to be, okay, which one's wrong? And then if so, one of these things is going to already be optimized and one of them is not. And so just figure working your way down that algorithm is going to answer 99% of the questions you're going to see.